Chad, why don't you come on up and, and preach the word of God, and I encourage you to listen with open ears. Thank you, Anthony. You'll have to bear with me. I've never used an ear mic before, so if I bump it or nudge it, I'll just have to recover as we go along here. Uh, if you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 7. We'll be looking at the last portion of that uh, scripture, that chapter, Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. The title of tonight's sermon is Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? And yes, I'm borrowing that. I'm stealing this title. If you, if you notice, the, uh, the verbiage there is, uh, is in italics because that is a film title. It's a 1967 film of the same name, which was produced and directed by Stanley Kramer. It starred Sidney Poitier, Catherine Hepburn, Spencer Tracy, and Hepburn's niece, Catherine Houghton. It was one of the few films of the time that depicted interracial marriage in a positive light. It was also the ninth and final on-screen pairing of Tracy and Hepburn. And Tracy was very ill during production, but he insisted on continuing. Filming of his role was completed just 17 days before he passed away in June 1967, with the film being released later that year in December. Catherine Hepburn never saw the completed film, saying that the memories it would evoke for her of Tracy were just too emotional. The main idea of our borrowing this film, and uh, thank you for letting me um, talk a little bit about it uh, during the title, I think it was the least we could do uh, was stealing the title. The main idea of us borrowing the title uh, tonight is not to promote or discuss interracial marriage or even racial issues. It is something far better. What we see in this passage in Luke's gospel doesn't just bring races together or socioeconomic classes together. It brings sinners to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we will see here tonight, Luke's main idea in this passage is this. God's forgiveness comes from knowing Jesus Christ, which transforms the guilty into the grateful. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees invited him, meaning Jesus, to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of fragrant oil and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with the hair of her head, kissing them and anointing them with the fragrant oil. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he said, say it. A creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You have judged correctly, he told him. I want to pause here in the, in the passage and uh, kind of set the, the stage of what's happening here. Um, uh, dining tables and, and um, the practice of dining is in the first century was much different than it is today. Um, uh, the Jewish tradition, um, and we see here in the passage, it, it speaks of Jesus reclining at the table. And so they would, they would lay on their left arm or their left hand, their left side, and they would eat with their right hand, um, the right hand being the clean hand, the left hand being the unclean hand. And that's, that's how it was. It wasn't at tables like we know today 
um, or even Da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper where they're all on one side of the table. Um, they, they recline this way. And so that's, that's how Jesus, uh, that's how he was. And, and, and this woman, she was at his feet. Um, so uh, jumping back into, into the scripture, um, turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who has forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this man? Who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I'm going to open in prayer. Holy Father, thank you for this time that we can be here tonight, that we can open your word and listen to what you have to tell us. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts that hunger for you. Give us thankful hearts. And Lord, I am thankful. I'm thankful for your forgiveness. I'm thankful for your love. I'm thankful for Jesus who lived a perfect life, who died and rose again, that we may know you. Give us ears to hear what you have to say here tonight. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. So Luke has a main idea. Again, God's forgiveness comes from knowing Jesus Christ, which transforms the guilty into the grateful. And I'll have, there are three truths that support this main idea. And number one is knowing Jesus means coming to him on his terms. Luke provides a clear backstory to what took place at Simon's table that night. In verses 8, 18 through 35 of Luke 7, we see the paramount difference between Simon the Pharisee and this woman who was a sinner. And we see this difference by Luke sharing how Jesus praises the person and ministry of John the Baptist, also known as those of you that come on Wednesday nights, what's another term for John the Baptist? Our boy Johnny B, right? So Luke shares how Jesus talks about John the Baptist and what happens after that. Um, John the Baptist, who preached a baptism of repentance. So what happens when Jesus tells John's disciples of his admiration of John? Luke 7 Verse, 30, uh, verse 29. So Jesus was talking to John's disciples. He just tells them in the verse before, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Verse 29. And when all the people, including the tax collectors, heard this, they acknowledged God's way of righteousness because they had been baptized with John's baptism. All of John's followers, not just some of them, all of them, including the tax collectors who heard Jesus speaking, they acknowledged God's way of righteousness because they had been baptized with John's baptism, which was the baptism of repentance. Well, how do we know that? Matthew 3, verses 1 through 2 says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, we don't know if this woman at Jesus' feet was a disciple of John, but what we do know by Luke's writing is that she acknowledged God's way of righteousness through a baptism of repentance. She came to know Jesus on his terms. Now, what of our Pharisee, Simon? Luke chapter 7, verse 30. But since the Pharisees and experts in the law had not been baptized by him, John, 
they rejected the plan of God for themselves. The woman had repented and believed and knew Jesus and his forgiveness. And the Pharisee rejected the plan of God for himself. I think it's pretty clear in Luke chapter 7 what kind of man we're dealing with in Simon the Pharisee. You see, he invited Jesus to come to him. He didn't go out of his way to get to Jesus like Nicodemus, though Nicodemus did it secretly at night. He invited Jesus to come to him, to eat with him. And then he apparently made a big deal about it. Because Luke tells us a woman in the town found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She found out about it. And she got to Jesus to share love and adoration and sacrifice, thanksgiving and worship. Now those of you that know me well know that I have an affinity for all things John Kennedy. And those of you who know me best, namely my wife and daughter, would say that I have an unhealthy obsession with the true facts of uh, his horrible assassination. And that may be because more than a few occasions I have uh, went to Dallas where the assassination took place, uh, twice of which I went with my dad. Um, and one of those times, which is seven years ago, uh, we went down at the spur of the moment to attend uh, a book signing uh, by Clint Hill, who was a special agent for the Secret Service. Um, uh, that day during the assassination, he was, uh, he was in charge of uh, guarding Mrs. Kennedy, and he was the one who left the follow-up car and, and climbed on the presidential limousine um, when that happened. Uh, but they were there um, at, at, at the, the museum doing a book signing, and, and uh, we went down there, and uh, the book was called Five Presidents, and they, uh, Clint Hill and Lisa McCubbin had written a few books before that. They collaborated on a few books, and which I had those. So Dad and I went down there, and I had, I had all, the, all of his books in the hopes that I could get him to sign those too because we bought tickets to the, the book signing, so we were going to get the new book, and they were going to autograph it. And um, I was just hoping that he might sign those others as well. So we arrive, and the event manager made very clear what her terms were. Number one, there are no pictures with Clint Hill and, and Lisa McCubbin. They're not going to be posing for pictures with you. Number two, the only book that he's signing is Five Presidents. And she looked at me when she said that, and I'm holding those other books there, and I'd, I don't know if, if I was the reason she said that. But those were her terms. So throughout the evening, we had a time where um, they were there, and you can just walk up to them and talk to them, and I did, and they graciously allowed pictures with me and everyone else there. Um, and then the time came when we were doing the book signing. And he was signing uh, the Five Presidents book, and he looked up at me and he said, do you have other books for me to sign? And I handed them over, and he graciously signed those as well. Those were, her, those were his terms. That wasn't the event manager's terms, but those were Mr. Hill's terms, and I was, I was surprised at that. And I was thankful for that, that those were his terms. The word of God is clear on what his terms are. That God's way, what God's ray of righteousness is. And there are no surprises here. John 14, 6, Jesus tells his disciple Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4, 12, Peter and John are defending the fact that they, uh, that they miraculously healed a lame beggar and they're speaking to the Jewish leaders and Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, says, there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to people and we must be saved by it. And this takes us to our second point. Coming to him on his terms requires repentance. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Jesus arrives on the scene and begins his public ministry. Mark writes, after John was arrested, our boy Johnny B., Jesus went to Galilee preaching the good news of God. 
This, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Matthew also talks about this. Matthew 4, 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach. Repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus demands repentance. A few weeks ago at work, um, at the bank, we had a webinar on self-awareness. And we were highly encouraged before this webinar to read uh, a Harvard Business Review article entitled, What Self-Awareness Really Is and How to Cultivate It. I'm gonna share a little bit uh, of it here with you tonight because it's very applicable to what we're talking about. Self-awareness seems to have become the latest management buzzword, and for good reason. Research suggests that when we see ourselves clearly, we are more confident and more creative, we make sounder decisions, build stronger relationships, and communicate more effectively. We're less likely to lie, cheat, and steal. We are better workers who get more promotions, and we're more effective leaders with more satisfied employees and more profitable companies. The article went on to uh, say that there are two types of self-awareness. Internal self-awareness represents how clearly we see our own values, passions, and aspirations. And external self-awareness, which simply means our understanding of how other people view us. Well, looking at Luke chapter 7, 36 through 50, it is evident in the text that we have a great example of what self-awareness is and what it is not. This woman, this woman demonstrated a healthy self-awareness and the Pharisee, he did not. Simon did not think of himself a sinner, quite the opposite. As a matter of fact, Simon's self-awareness looked more like self-promotion. Simon is indignant thinking himself the more, most important person at the table and clearly not knowing who Jesus is, says to himself in verse 39, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. There's a lot of arrogance there. And there's clearly a, a not knowing who Jesus is. He refers to Jesus, the King of Kings, he refers to Jesus, prophet, priest, and king, as this man. If he were a prophet, he would know who is touching him. And this Pharisee, Simon, he's, he's too good to be touched by such a woman. He's too good to be touched by a sinner. Um, he does not recognize who is at his table. Luke shows us, Simon has little awareness of himself, let alone anyone else. This woman, however, she knew herself. She had self-awareness. She knew herself to be a profound sinner, but a profound sinner saved by profound grace. It's important for Christians to be self-aware. I want to share an illustration um, from that webinar that I think is... Uh, applicable to this woman's story. Um, thank you. This was part of our webinar on self-awareness. And I think this is a, a, a very applicable picture to what we're talking about. Again, as you look at this illustration, let's think about, let's think about this woman at, at Jesus' feet. This woman was self-aware both internally and externally. And this picture, is a, it's a before and after. It's a before and after in the context of tonight's scripture. Before acknowledging God's way of righteousness, she is simply a worthless, little, helpless sinner, the kitten on the outside. But afterwards, she looks nothing like her former self. As followers of Christ, we should reflect such a transformation. Our reflection should be one of repentance. Just as, just as one is saved and being saved, true repentance is repenting and being repentant. It is not a one and done transaction. What Jesus demands in Mark 1, 14 through 15 is a lifestyle. 
This is the self-awareness of a Christian. A few years ago, my good friend shared with me a video. Um, it was a video of a sermon preached by Vody Bauckham Jr. And it is uh, his sermon on brokenness. And my good friend uh, shared that with me in a time when I needed to hear that. Um, I needed, it was a time in my life when I needed to be broken over my sin. And this passage of scripture that Vody Bauckham Jr. preached on in his sermon was Psalm 51, which was David's brokenness after his sin. And Psalm 51 tells us that sin has consequences. And Bodhi Bauckham Jr. brought out that Psalm 51 tells us that these consequences of sin are stains and scars. Sin stains and sin scars. And we also know that sin gives something else. It gives guilt. We are guilty because we sin. And there are differences. And thank God there are differences between those who know God's way of righteousness and those who do not. The consequence of sin, it's the same for both of us. Sin stains and scars. We all have that. But the guilt, the guilt is what's different. That's what separates those who know Jesus Christ and those who don't. Because those who know Jesus Christ, the guilt has been removed. It has been removed. I realize repentance is not asking God, why me? When facing the consequence of your sin. But rather asking God, why me? When facing the blessing of his forgiveness. King David he knew such blessing, as did this woman. After he was confronted uh, by Nathan the prophet, uh, King David, yes, he wrote Psalm 51 to share the brokenness of his sin, his disobedience, his despising God. He later wrote Psalm 32 to talk about the blessing of God's forgiveness. I want to read the first five verses of Psalm 32. David writes, How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is the man the Lord does not charge with sin, in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was dra drained as in the summer's heat. There's the consequence. Then I acknowledge my sin to you and do not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you took away the guilt of my sin. As Christians, we deal with the consequences. The consequences remain. The guilt of our sin is, thank God, removed. That is the difference. David owned and lived with the consequences of his sin, yet his repentance was true because he accepted God's blessing of forgiveness. Therefore, he knew joy. David's story is one of the guilty being transformed into the grateful. And so is this woman. She too asked God, why me? As her tears washed Jesus' feet. And she wiped his feet with her hair and kissed his feet. Why me, Lord? Thank you, Lord. I know, I love you, Lord. This takes us to our third truth. Knowing Jesus is a life of peace. Turn with me back to Luke chapter 7. I'm going to start in verse 47. Jesus is speaking. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. 
Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You know, there's a a portion of this passage that I, I struggled with for a long time. And then the truth the truth finally um, came to me. And what I struggled with was Jesus saying, but the one who is forgiven little loves little. It finally dawned on me what he's saying there. What he's saying there is those that who have been forgiven little, they haven't yet acknowledged God's righteousness. They haven't been forgiven by God. Because no part of God's forgiveness is little. It is always much. Because it costs much. God's forgiveness looks like the cross. And that is a great price. That is his terms. Those are his terms. The cross of Jesus. Luke shares in this passage what knowing Jesus and what not knowing Jesus looks like. This woman... At his feet, she knew him. She knew Jesus. Simon and those who were at the table with Jesus did not. They say, who is this man? Who is this man who even forgives sins? This woman had assurance. Simon and the others did not. This woman had peace. There's an old uh, Christian quote from a few decades ago um, that I think is a good illustration for us here tonight. And it is, no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. This woman arrived in peace and was commanded to go and continue on the same way. And how is it she knew Jesus to pursue him and worship him in this fashion? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 50, your faith has saved you. Where does saving faith come from? Paul writes in Romans 10, 9 and 10, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. Also in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Paul writes, For you have been saved by grace through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. Salvation is because of who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he is doing. Jesus told this woman her faith has saved her, but he didn't mean she saved herself. Jesus declares her faith saved her because her faith is in him, the one and only who can forgive sins. This is the only way. These are his terms. I heard in a church service a few years ago, it was during the song service, it's something I hope I I never forget. As Christians, we do not work for approval. We work from approval. This woman, she shows us what that looks like, what true faith looks like. Romans 5.1 says, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith. We have been declared righteous by faith. What is faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 defines faith as the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Hebrews also says that God's word is living and active. Those of us here tonight that have dared to open this word, we have dared to listen to what Jesus is saying. And what Jesus asked all those ages and ages ago at Simon's table, he is asking you tonight. Do you see this woman? Do you see her? The reality of what she hoped for, the proof of what she had yet to see, was reclining at Simon's table. 
Oh, praise God. He's here. I must get to him. Do you see this woman? He's here. I can touch him. I have a question too. Are you so grateful? You know, we could, we could be here for hours tonight looking at each other and coming up with hundreds of ways in which we are different. And perhaps a couple of ways in which we are the same. And there is one way that we are the same. We are all sinners. My wife said this morning in our small group class, we're, we're all hot messes. And we are. We're all sinners. And I pray all of us in this room tonight are like this woman. And like me. A rotten sinner. Saved by grace. Transformed from the guilty to the grateful and being transformed day by day because of the peace that comes from only knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. He's here. Praise God, he's here. Race to him tonight as that woman did. Reach out to him. Get to him, no matter what it takes. Give him your adoration. Give him your love. Tell him he's worthy. Let's close in prayer. Holy Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your teaching. Thank you for speaking all those years ago and for speaking here tonight. You are good. Thank you for your forgiveness. Oh, the cost, the price of the forgiveness of sin. May we never, never take that for granted. But always be ready to worship you in any way we can because you are worthy. Thank you that we can know you. Not just read about you, or hear about you, or learn facts. We can know you. Thank you for knowing us and loving us. Praise your holy name. Bless your holy name. Amen.